Good morning. Good to see y'all. Uh, so in my last church, we had a lot of stained glass windows, very much like these, beautiful and meaningful, but not quite like these in that the stained glass windows at Christ Church in Ponte Vedra Beach uh, are sort of unorthodox. There are, uh, there are all sorts of details and hidden figures in there. Uh, mostly what you would see if you looked at a panel would be a story in the life of Jesus, kind of like these. But then if you looked a little bit more closely, you might find an homage to the first rector or the second rector or something like that, a hidden lobster, a surfer on a surfboard. There's no telling what you might notice if you really paid attention. One of my favorites was a stained glass window of, an, of the evangelist Matthew. Uh, there were four such stained glass windows, five stained glass windows behind the altar in the chapel, Jesus and the, the four evangelists. As you might expect, each one of those gospel writers had uh, in his hand a book or something like that and parchment, and each one was figured in such a way that you knew that these were gospel writers. But should you happen to get bored in a long sermon or something like that and really pay attention, you would start to see some of those weird details come through. First thing you would probably notice on Matthew is that he was bespectacled. This is a non-historically accurate trait. He had, uh, he had wire rim glasses, perfectly circular, pretty handsome devil he was. And, uh, and that might have been a clue that you should pay more attention. And luckily for you, the sermon would probably keep going on so you had more time. Uh, if you look down from there, sort of scroll down the image, you would notice that his gospel book doesn't really look like some of the other ones. In fact, that's not a book at all, is it? That is a briefcase. Strange. On that briefcase, there seems to be some kind of, I don't know, some kind of lettering of some sort. It's like a script. It almost looks like shadows, but if you really pay attention, the letters IRS are written on that briefcase. I have this hunch that maybe some of the founders of that church down in Ponte Vedra weren't a big fan of, uh, of our government agency, and, uh, and maybe we're picking on tax collectors through the years, uh, making them out to be villains of a sort. It's not historically accurate at all that our modern-day IRS is anything like our first-century tax collectors, but the joke got to stand a little bit. Those first century tax collectors were of a different sort in Palestine. Under Roman imperial authority, these folks were given all kinds of license to do all kinds of terrible things to people. And so while they made a little bit of money in the process from the government, what they really did was use the occasion to extort from other people a little bit more money. Do some strong arm tactics to try to uh, squeeze those who are already being squeezed by Caesar. You can imagine that tax collectors like Matthew didn't get a lot of dinner invitations, but he got one that would change his life. Now, I really do think it is the dinner invitation that changes Matthew's life, not the moment where Jesus says, follow me. And he says, okay, I got nothing else to do. Sure. But he finds himself at dinner. This is what he records in his own story about his encounter with Jesus, is how important that dinner was. I imagine that he sat there looking around this table while reclining with Jesus, seeing that there were other tax collectors and sinners there, some of them worse than he was. And it resolved some kind of tension in his heart about whether or not he was worthy to dine. Well, as you saw in the text, and as you might imagine, though they were enjoying their dinner, the religious elite around didn't appreciate this at all. Why does your teacher dine with these people, with them? Anytime it starts off with something like, with them, ooh, you know you're in trouble, right? They confront Jesus. They confront his disciples. You let the wrong kind of people in, Jesus. You seem to be doing that a lot these days. I can't imagine that Jesus' statement 
helped them very much, quoting from Hosea and offering to them that healthy people don't need a doctor, but the sick do. What I really wonder about is whether later on when he was having dinner with the Pharisees and the tax collectors and sinners weren't there, if they realized that he was still talking about them. Jesus didn't only eat with sinners and tax collectors, but with Pharisees and the religious elite too. One gets the sense that it was Jesus' hope always that if you just had a chance to be at this table for a little while, maybe grace would make its way into your heart. Maybe this would be the opportunity that you needed to let grace be a part of your life. Maybe the one most needing grace, most of all, needed the invitation to be at the table, that they might experience exactly that love. I think that Jesus is probably still holding on to that exact hope, that the chance to be at a table together is the opportunity for grace to make its way into the heart of the one who needs it most. At St. David's, uh, we have been learning to say, and are still learning to say, that there is a space at the table for everyone. That's the language that we gave to a values statement as an organization during part of our work about strategic planning that I know uh, has been going on for a really long time and we're still not done with it yet, so we haven't really talked about it too much more than that. But uh, it's a great statement. Or at least I think it is. I know that there are some who are probably cynical about slogans like that. But I think it's great because it accords with Jesus and Jesus' hope for how people would gather with him. That there would be a place at the table for everyone. It's not some saccharine hope for a new world order or some woke liberal agenda or something like that. But just this idea, the very hope. That leaving space at the table can allow someone to find themselves and to find grace is something that applies not just to church worship services, maybe especially not just to this. Like, this is where it's easy. It gets a little bit harder even at other tables in church than it does here. It's easier for there to be a space at the table for everyone in this room than even at breakfast. And sometimes harder still, maybe even always harder still, is making sure there's space at the table for everyone at the other tables we go to during the rest of the week. With the people that become for us the them instead of the us. Sometimes those are the easy targets. Sometimes those are our own family members. Sometimes because of some deep animosity that we hold on to or is being brought to bear against us. And sometimes because it's just dang hard to eat with people sometimes who are driving you crazy. My kids are not at this service right now. Let me tell you, if ever they were going to be a sermon illustration, that might be the day. And I know that they would say, sometimes it's really hard to eat with dad too. So we learn to say how important it is that there is a place at the table for everyone and that we will never turn away or remove that place for you because this meal is so important. And if we can learn how to say that here, then perhaps we can take that out into the world. And if we can learn how to say that so that grace can be a part of one individual's life and maybe change one person. And maybe we say it in such a way that it's our hope collectively that our collective heart will change also. I don't need to tell you any examples of how sick we are as human people with malevolent tribal attitudes that break down our very hope that there might be something called unity in this world. But we have always been that way. Contrary to those who... uh, will say that this is the worst it's ever been. Historians will tell you, yeah, no, it's been a lot worse than a lot of other times in human history. Perhaps, though, this is just the time that we are paying attention the most. One such worse time 
was probably in the 1860s. In 1861, the beginning of the Civil War in South Carolina, the place where the Civil War began, there was born a young man named William Alexander Gary. G-U-E-R-R-Y, if you want to look him up later on. He would eventually become a deacon and then a priest in South Carolina, and then in 1907, finally, bishop. He had seen firsthand through his literal entire life the warring and strife and pain and division caused by racial enmity in a place like South Carolina. The deep division and the way that people held on to it as if somehow it would bring life to them. In the 1920s, as a bishop, he decided that what he would try to do to provide some unity in this difficult place was to have an assisting bishop called a suffragan bishop who was black to show some unity at the top of the org chart, so to speak, so the parishioners in the diocese could begin to work on unity themselves. He never got the chance. On June 5th, 1928, a retired priest in his own diocese came into his office and assassinated him sitting in his chair. This priest was upset because Gary was too progressive, radical, the idea of having a black bishop in a church that had plenty of black parishioners. His desire to promote racial equality was too much the idea that unity might be a gospel imperative was intolerable. And so he was shot, and four days later, he died. You can imagine that this priest and this bishop spent a lot of time at a table like this one and plenty of occasions together. He had been bishop for 21 years at that point. So many things can be said that must be true. Serving together at a table like this, coming to church, doesn't mean everything's going to get better. Grace doesn't have the same effect on every human heart. There is no guarantee of a permanently changed life. I can't help but wonder or be curious whether Bishop Gary and this priest only gathered at a table like this and failed to gather at other tables as well. Had this become some kind of pro forma ritual, a sacrifice to be offered to check the box of religion, alongside one another even, and they didn't break bread together at home. They didn't share real wine and real bread. The gatherings at the table had become a shadow of the radical meal that Jesus had initiated and at which he presided, hoping that tax collectors and sinners and Pharisees and righteous elite would all be able to get together in hopes that grace would define the gathering. To join one another at a table like this could be an antidote for what the world offers on its dinner menu. Animosity and division and power grabbing and manipulation and tribal malevolence, it could be. But it won't be if all this is for us is one hour a week where we check a box. It won't be if we just come to eat. It can't be an antidote to the forces of this world that seek to divide us if we don't take the grace that we receive into our lives that we might share it with others. We don't become what we eat, so to speak. We take what is practiced here and we offer it elsewhere. One thing is for sure that the other tables in our lives will also become opportunities for us to encounter Christ and his reconciling love. So I don't say that hoping that you will stop coming to church, obviously. But instead, I encourage you to take this as more than a simple meal at which you have a place. 
Receive the grace here that allows you to make sure there is a place for others at your tables in your life. Dine here, yes, with Christ. Yes, fill your heart here with his love and his grace. And yes, go forth from here, please, to both receive and to offer the reconciling love of Christ at every meal that you share with all of God's children, the tax collectors, the Pharisees, the people in your family who have become a them instead of an us, and all the other children of God. Until finally, by God's grace, we are gathered together at one table. Those who are next to us, those who have gone before us, and those who will come. And we understand fully that in God's heart, in God's grace, because of God's love and at God's table, there is always a place for everyone. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen.